And, and you can be seated. Glad you're with us today. And I enjoyed those throwback songs myself. Uh, as Kendall said, it, it re, we were talking in the back about it. It reminds you of times uh, when God moved in your life. And uh, just very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, I do want to encourage you if you're a new member or interested in joining Rolling Brook, that we have a new members connect luncheon today. It's over in the fellowship hall and come and be a part of it. You can ask us questions. We want to get to know you and encourage you in joining us and as we serve Christ as a church. And uh, you're invited, no cost whatsoever, and uh, I think you'll be blessed. Really glad you're with us. We are in a series uh, looking at some of the misused and misapplied scriptures and some things that are said that are just flat out wrong. Uh, they sound biblical, but they're really not. They're, and a lot of passages are misunderstood. And we talked last week about why it happens. And just as a reminder, um, the, uh, the passage for today is uh, we're looking at Matthew 7.1. Uh, and we need to always, when we look at Scripture, make sure we're reading it in context, what's around it, uh, where it's taking place, um, who's saying what, um, what are the events occurring, what happened before and what happened after. And then, so we want to keep it in context, and we want to bring the weight of canon to it, and by that I mean what, does other, what do other passages in God's Word in the 66 other books say about this particular topic. And so last week we looked at uh, John 14, 14, where Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it will be done. And so just if you just leave it like that, it sounds very, that's, you know, okay, we're done. I can just ask anything and it's going to get done. But uh, there are other passages in God's word, the, the rest of the canon, uh, that talk about, hey, if you're not treating your wife well, your prayers will be hindered. If you're not giving to the poor, uh, your prayers will be hindered. And so we need to bring the weight of canon to the scripture as well. In other words, another way of saying it is that scripture interprets scripture. And then we need to be living out the scripture. Just live out the scripture and see if it's true. And um, yeah, make sure that we're living it out properly as well. And so um, we're looking at that. So that's what we're doing. Today we're looking at one of the just most favorite passages of, of the world. Uh, Christian, non-Christian, it doesn't matter. Almost everybody knows Matthew 7, 1. Y'all finish it for me. Judge not, ye, lest ye be judged. It sounds so cool. Isn't it interesting? Most of you do not read a King James Bible. But you just said it in the King James. And it, it just, we've learned it in the King James, and it sounds so amazing. This passage has been twisted more than a bag of Twizzlers. If this passage had a theme song, it would be, let's do the twist or the Beatles twist and shout. Vody Bauckham says of Matthew 7.1, he says this, that it's the new John 3.16. Vody Bauckham, I love that. So we, everybody knows John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but will have eternal everlasting life. We all knew that growing up. It seems like now everyone just seems to know Matthew 7, 1. It is music to a sinner's ears. Often when someone says, judge not lest ye be judged, what a person is really saying when it's applied to them or where they, when they say it back, uh, what they're really saying is, you can't tell me what I'm doing is wrong or you can't tell me what to do. So you need to back off. You're as bad as I am or probably even worse. It's used to justify sin or a sinful lifestyle. And it's used as a license to do whatever we want to do. It's a counterpunch. Someone says, hey, let me tell you something, uh, this, is, uh, you know, this is something wrong, you're doing this wrong. We'll talk about the, this in a moment, uh, and they you'll judge not lest ye be judged. So there's the punch, this is the counter punch, it's a way to strike back. It's a passage used by non-believers to attack followers of Jesus, right? We are so judgmental. Who are you to judge? Who are you to judge, right? Um, and there may be some truth to that, as we'll see, as how we should approach non-believers. And it's a passage that is being used in the culture wars today. Again, context matters. Context is king. And uh, we can't just isolate Matthew 7, 1, okay, from the rest of canon. We can't just separate it from uh, the rest of the passage. And I think this is really interesting. Jesus is talking to his disciples and others. This is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. So you know that Jesus is just lightening up with an amazing sermon. And notice what Jesus says. And this is verse 6. 
And what I'm about to say is going to sound really strange, but hang with me for a moment. Verse 6 is part of this passage. Okay, I'll explain what I mean in a moment. He says, do not give dogs what is holy and throw pearls to pigs. And so Jesus says, judge not lest ye be judged. So it's kind of like don't judge. But then what does Jesus do in verse number 6? He makes a judgment. There are people who are dogs and pigs. And you say, well, wait a second, that's Jesus. He's the righteous judge. He can do that. So checkmate, you can't say anything back to that. Well, if you go on in Matthew 7, I'll go a little further down in Matthew 7, Jesus tells his listeners, you and me, followers of Jesus, to beware of false prophets. Well, to determine someone, whether they're false or not, what do we have to do? We have to make a judgment. We have to evaluate. We have to listen. We have to, to watch. And we make that evaluation. So we're called to judge. And then in Matthew 18, 15, and there are others. This is the, the weight of canon coming to this passage. Uh, Matthew 18, he says this, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Well, you have to make a judgment if determining your brother has sinned against you, right? What's interesting, by the way, the earliest manuscripts don't have those two words, against you. It actually reads, if your brother sins. So the uh, um, uh, against you has been added. That's interesting. At least I find it interesting. So let's get real practical. If we just read 7-1 all by itself, judge not lest ye be judged, it sounds like Jesus is saying... Um, Hey, if you see Pastor Bill leaving the HEB and he's stuffing a roast in his jacket and trying to sneak out, he's shoplifting, you really can't say anything. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Right? I don't think Jesus is saying that. And let's get real intense. We live in a culture that seems to be saying that sexually anything goes. Well, if I'm having, I'm in an inappropriate relationship outside my marriage. Should you not judge that? Is that what Jesus is saying? Well, no, just don't. You, you can't judge that. I don't think so. And so let me just lay it out there. Jesus is not saying to his followers, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus is not saying to you, don't ever judge. In fact, when you read the passage in totality, it does invite us to judge. That word then, then go to your brother and help them in their problem. So Jesus does want us to have discernment and speak into the life of others. And if you want to call that judging, okay, I'm saying discernment and speaking life into others, so be it. But there is a way that it needs to be done. And we're going to talk about that. And I hope you listen carefully to every point. I really do. I think this is, um, I just really, um, if you miss something, you'll, I think it can blow up the whole passage. And so please, I pray that the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Because we don't want it to be done in a way that we are hypocrites. So how are we to judge? What are we to judge? Who are we to judge? And how do we handle Matthew 7, 1, judge not, lest ye be judged in the proper context. So how do we judge? One. Judge your brother and sister humbly. Judge your brother and sister humbly. What Jesus does so beautifully in this passage is call his followers to search themselves. He invites you, he invites me to check our own hearts, to see if there's a plank in our own eye. It's just striking imagery, right? It's just plank, it's so uh, in your face. In other words, Jesus is saying this, before judging, we need to be repenting. Before judging, you and I need to be repenting. And what does repent mean? It's not just going to God and saying, God, I'm sorry. No, it's turning from your sin and walking to Jesus Christ. It's walking away from that sin. So we don't want to just have this double standard. And what that means is we need you and I, before we go to our brother and sister in Christ, we need to go to God and seek forgiveness, letting him remove this massive plank in our eye. And then when you experience the, the, the forgiveness of God, if it's real, it will change how you approach your brother or sister. 
I love what Francis Chan did. He said this in a, in a we do a Bible study as a staff uh, each Tuesday, and he, he used this illustration for the book of Job. I'm going to use it here. If God somehow, some way was manifest behind that black curtain, right, just the glory of God was behind that black curtain over there, and I was in some sin, and you said, boy, I, I need to go talk with Bill, but first I am going to go to, I'm going to go ask for forgiveness. And you walked behind that curtain and experienced like really the glory, the Shekinah glory of God. Do you think it would change how you talk to me about my sin? You have been in the presence of a holy and righteous God. You and I would be so humbled at that. And it would probably change how you walk out. You wouldn't say, well, okay, now let's talk about your sin. It would probably be very gentle, as you'll see, and very loving and very humble because we would experience something incredibly holy. Jesus says that people who judge other brother or sisters while having a serious sin issue of their own, he calls them that dreaded word, hypocrites. And that's a really strong word. It's reserved for legalists primarily in Jesus' day. People who believe that following rules would lead to God. It's used 18 times in the New Testament in God's word in totality, 18 times. And every one of them, every time the word hypocrite is used, guess who says it? Jesus. Jesus says it. Here, Jesus is rebuking. Those who measure others and judge others by higher standards than they judge themselves. And I would ask, is that you? Do you hold your brother or sister in Christ to the same standard you hold yourself to? If you came to me and said, Bill, how, how long did you pray this week? What was your prayer time like? And I said, well, I prayed uh, I, uh, this week, uh, seven, I do my little math, and I prayed, uh, just, I prayed three hours. And you judge that. How could you judge? How can you pray just three hours? Man of God, pastor of a church. Okay, well, how long did you pray? Are you holding the same measurement for you as you are for me? And that's just an example. Um, So do you hold your brother and sister in Christ to the same standard you hold yourself? We often hold others to a higher or unrealistic standard because when they fail to make that standard, it makes us look good and elevates our own standing, right? When you, it it just makes us feel good. Jonathan Edwards wrote uh, about this. He said, and this indeed And this is indeed the very main difference between the joy of a hypocrite and the joy of a true saint. Hypocrite and true saint. The hypocrite rejoices in himself that he judged. Self is the first foundation of his joy. The latter rejoices in God. The hypocrite rejoices. Oh, I nailed him. Oh, I nailed her. Oh, I know what they did. I know their mistake. I know their sin. Woo. The letter rejoices in God. God, the, the sin has been revealed. God, we're going to move on this. Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy might put it this way. If you rejoice in yourself when judging, you might be a hypocrite. I mean, when we're judging someone for a sin, honestly, gang, it should break us. We should weep for that person. And so the first point, we need to judge one another humbly. Secondly, we need to judge our brothers and sisters' actions and not hearts or motives. And this is the what. What do we judge? The the actions. We get ourselves into a lot of trouble when we judge a person's motives. 1 Kings 8.39 tells us God alone knows every human heart. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, he says we should refrain from judging someone else's heart, that God will do that at the appointed time. He says he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. Leave the motive judging to God. Can I get an amen? We need to confine our judgments to what we can see objectively, what we can hear, what we can see. We may think we know motives, 
but we need to yield our opinions to the truth of God's word. He is omniscient. We are not. In other words, if we think we know the motives and hearts, then we are putting ourselves in a position of being God. I'm going to tell you a story. and The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Uh, a friend of mine, Bob, is what I'm going to call him. Uh, he and I just knew this person and um, self-professing Christian. And he, we had a common friend and he just knew that that common friend was attracted to someone of the same sex. He just knew it. He just knew it. What were the signs? What, how, how do you know, Bob? I can just tell. I just know. He just knew it. Well, it turns out this person fell in love, started dating someone of the opposite sex, and they got married. And they have a family now, and they're doing great. And even after that, Bob couldn't believe it and said, no, 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 that, that whole marriage is the facade. He knew the heart. He knew the heart of the person, the motive of the person. And we have a, we could look at that and say, okay, we either know the act, we can judge the actions, which we're called to do, or we can judge the heart, which only God can do. God alone knows the hearts. Let me give you a really good verse to live by. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 7. It's one of those verses that just came to me um, just a couple of years ago. You know, you read the Bible and you say, oh, I didn't know that was in there. That must be new. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 is a great verse. It says this, love assumes the best. Love assumes the best. Love assumes the best. Are you a loving person? Well, you know how we can tell maybe? If you assume the best. I hope that's you and I hope that's me. Number three, make sure you're judging what is indisputable with brothers and sisters. And this is another what. The Bible teaches something really important. Huge in this discussion. Paul says in the book of Romans that there are disputable matters and indisputable matters. Okay? Disputable matters and indisputable matters. What's an indisputable matter? Well, let me give you some examples of an indisputable matter. The Bible is clear in the atoning death of Jesus Christ. The resurrection, the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is an indisputable matter. Paul says without the resurrection, the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, we live or we preach, our faith is in vain. The return of Jesus Christ, indisputable. Salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, indisputable. Salvation only in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Indisputable. Circumcision is not a sign of faith. Indisputable. Marriage between one man and one woman, indisputable. Sanctity of human life, indisputable. Forgiving one another as Christ forgave you, indisputable. Two genders, indisputable. Loving one another, indisputable. But Paul says there are disputable matters, so we don't dispute those. That's, those, all, those are things that you and I should all agree on. But Paul says there are disputable matters. And when Paul talks about disputable matters, he's usually, it's usually talking about Christians eating food sacrificed to idols. That was offending some other Christians. And Scripture says we should not judge each other or treat each other contemptuously on these. This is what he writes. It's in your notes, Romans 14. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over, here it is, disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything. Another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Then he says in verse 13, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. 
Stop passing judgment on one another. So what are disputable matters? These are the non-essentials of the Christian life, the gray area. Things that the Bible may not be, just like, just Jesus, would you just tell me what you want? He leaves us, there seems to be some gray areas in the Bible that we're just not sure. These are the disputable things that we, as you'll see, need to avoid. Avoid. Let me give you some examples. Okay. I'm stepping on toes this morning on this particular part. So this is disputable. Is it a sin to miss church because you're hunting? Said the hunters. (laughs) Is it a sin to miss church because you're fishing? Is it a sin to miss church because you're going to the Astros game? Is it a sin to miss church because... You're just tired. You want to sleep in, sleep in. The Bible says, forsake not the assembly. Are you sinning when you do those things? Some will say, some will say, uh, yes, you're forsaking the assembly. Others will say, no. We can experience God, you know, on the golf course. We can experience God fishing. We can, you know, we can have worship at blasting. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it can be a disputable issue. How about is it okay for a Christian to be in debt? Is it okay for a Christian to be in excessive debt? Oh, well, you said, yeah, they can be. What's it, what is excessive? Is it a sin for a Christian to shop at Target? Ah, you see, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of all the people that shopped at Target this week. Is it a sin to put pineapple topping on pizza? It is. I can tell you that one. How did, I don't even know how that happened. It had to be a complete accident. There are disputable things. There are disputable things. Uh, I share this with you just in my faith journey, not to pat myself on the back. If anything, it's, it's indicting. Um, as you probably have heard or know, I love coffee. I think if you cut me open, I'm gonna, it's going to be Folgers. And uh, I just really dig coffee. And uh, there's a place in a lot of communities that sells coffee. And it's a, a little shop. They're everywhere. And uh, their coffee costs around four bucks. And uh, they're small. And so uh, I would go there and get coffee. And then I learned that that place that sells coffee to the masses is one of the largest contributors to Planned Parenthood. And so for me, I said, well, I'm I'm not going to buy coffee from there anymore. I'm through. I'm not going to contribute to a company that's contributing to Planned Parenthood. And then what happened to me, I would see Anthony Rutledge walking up with a coffee cup from that place. And in my little mind, (laughs) well, Anthony needs to repent. Look at what he's doing. Disputable or indisputable? Disputable. I mean, do we really want to go down that road? Target? Exxon, all these places where we give our money to, do we really want to do that? And so Paul says, there's disputable things out there. And this is where it gets really hard. I I, I shared this story as well. We had a dear friend of ours, Jerry and Lisa. Lisa was a new Christian. And uh, we were at our church, this is many, many years ago. And we we sat in chairs in that church. And I'll never forget it. She came back in tears one Sunday uh, to Jerry and I were in the back. We weren't in church. So anyway, uh, she came back and uh, she had put her Bible on the ground because she didn't want to put it on a seat so it could be open. She put the Bible on the ground and the lady one seat over said that she was in sin because she placed the Bible on the ground. She needs to pick that Bible up right now and repent. Disputable, indisputable. Disputable. And hear me, not judging actions that are disputable is hard to do because we feel very strongly about our personal convictions. 
Do you have a disputable matter that you live by? And this is critical because if we're going to honor God and be discerning brothers and sisters and speak life into others, this really demands we be in the word so we can make judgment. Is this really what God's word says? Is this really what it means? So we need to be in God's word so we don't make the disputable indisputable and we don't make the indisputable Disputable, And I'll tell you why this is important, because unity of the church is at stake. Because what divides churches and Christians is division over disputable matters. The low-hanging fruit, what color should the carpet be? Disputable or indisputable? Disputable. Okay? Don't make that an indisputable thing. Now, what we see in the culture today people who want to make everything disputable, churches who want to make everything disputable. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, marriage between one man and one woman, well, those are disputable things. And so we see culture today trying to push that and churches trying to push that as well. And then there are others who want to make everything indisputable, a rigid set of rules and laws. Make sure the sin you're judging isn't someone, um, excuse me, you're judging in someone, make sure the sin you're judging in someone isn't something that is a disputable matter. And here's a little nugget. People who judge for others, who judge others for disputable matters are people who want to control them and want his or her conscience to be the conscience of all. I see Anthony with that cup of coffee. I want him to think what I think. I want my conscience to be his conscience, his conscience to be my conscience about that cup of coffee. By the way, I do go to that store now and drink coffee, just for the record. And what's the best thing we do about disputable matters? Romans 14, 22. Paul basically says to the Romans, close to your mouth. My wife would tell me when we first got married, gallete. Don't say anything. This is, um, be quiet. It's between you and God. The the, the passage is in your notes. Okay. Disputable matter. If it's a disputable matter, just be quiet. (laughs) Don't judge anybody. Hush. Disputable? Yeah. Yeah. The fourth point is how we judge. And this is flat out scripture from our Lord and Savior himself, John 8, 24. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So he doesn't say don't judge. He says judge with right judgment. So we don't want to judge by appearances. Have you ever judged someone by their appearances? That person can't be a Christian. Look at fill in the blank. That person is a Christian because fill in the blank. So what is right judgment? That's what I want to focus on here. Judgment, right judgment is judgment with restoration as the end game. Judgment as, with restoration as the end game. Galatians 6.1, Paul says this. He's writing to the church. He says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. And that makes sense. I mean, how can you re- remove a plank from someone's eye gently? Restore someone. That's the goal. It's not done to elevate ourselves and to give high fives to one another. It's to restore. And again, I would ask the questions, are you saddened when someone is found out or caught in sin? Do you rejoice? Do you play the game? I got you or I'll help you. Because I don't think we're supposed to go to a person. Low-hanging fruit here. Let's just say Kendall walks up on me and I'm looking at pornography on my computer. Is Kendall supposed to come to me and say, Bill, you're looking at, I see you looking at pornography on your computer and walk off? No. Paul says to the Galatians, restore someone gently. You go to them, hey, I see what you're struggling with. Let me walk with you now. Let me help restore you. I think we fall into this trap to where we go to people and we say, I see your sin. I see your sin. I see your sin and your sin and walk away. And there's no, there's judgment, but there's no restoration. And it's not gentle and it's not done in love. We like the drop the mic moments. 
I saw you flirting with someone who wasn't your spouse. Drop the mic and we walk away. Instead of saying, hey, is everything okay in your marriage? Can I pray with you? If you need to talk, I'm here. Oftentimes we get caught up in judgment without restoration. And that's judgment for the sake of judgment. And so we need to look at how did Jesus judge, I think, in all of this, is what is right judgment. And Jesus judges our sin, and he restores us. So he doesn't just say, Bill, you got a problem. He then restores me. John 2, and so we want to judge like Jesus, and that means going to someone with grace and truth. John 2, or John 1, gives two attributes about Jesus. It's really interesting. He gives these, you could come up with any attribute. Jesus comes up with two. And in John 1, 14, uh, uh, John says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And if we are under the power of the Holy Spirit to live like Jesus, that means when it comes to judging, we need to judge filled with grace and truth. Filled with grace and truth. If we judge, and so think of it this way. There are two tracks. Grace and truth. If we just judge with grace, anything goes. Don't worry about it. You sin. It's not just you. That's just the way you are. If we judge with just truth, there's no grace. There's no forgiveness. There's no mercy. I like what Randy Alcorn said. He said this, truth without grace breeds self-righteousness and legalism. Grace without truth breeds deception and moral compromise. The key to true Christian spirituality is to integrate these two qualities into life, imitating the character of Jesus Christ. And so for you and me, our goal, our objective as we judge others is to make sure we're walking in grace and truth. We want to go right down that middle there. We don't want to just be a person of, ah, it's no big deal. But we don't want to be a person without any grace and say, you're done. I saw what you did. You're done. It's over for you. Get out of here. Get out of this church. Get out of this community. Now, here's the who. And this is going to disappoint some of you, and it's going to free some of you. Okay? So I think Jesus calls us, and God's word, the, the weight of Scripture calls us that it's okay to judge. Parents, if your child lies to you, guess what? You can judge that. You see me shoplifting that rump of roast? You can judge that. But in all of this, our judging is reserved for the actions of brothers and sisters in Christ. That's who our judging is for. My brother can judge me. He's a brother in Christ. I'm a brother in Christ. We can judge one another. Let me just kind of carpet bomb this on you. Matthew 7, the word brother is used three times. Jesus talks about going to your brother. In Matthew 18, when your brother sins against you. When Paul writes to the Galatians, brothers and sisters, restore someone gently. And then Paul says this, just point blank in 1 Corinthians 5.12, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? See? God will judge those on the outside. Okay? So what you see when the weight of Scripture comes on this, yeah, we, have a, we call it judging, but it's accountability. It's sharpening iron. It's walking together. It's encouraging one another. It's being humble enough to receive correction and 
bold enough to speak truth into the life of someone. So let's go back to Matthew 7 and understand why judging is reserved for those of the church, brothers and sisters, the called out. Now, this is not going to come as a shock to you. The way of the world operates vastly different from the way of Jesus. The world has not been enlightened by the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And Matthew 7, 6 is just so revealing. This ought to be a passage that when you watch TV, this comes to mind. Boy, this passage is like, oh, yeah, God's word is absolutely true. It explains why the world responds the way it does to the way of Jesus, his righteousness, and simply you being a light to the world. Verse 6 is part of this passage, as I said before. It's not a throwaway line. It's not a quick aside. Jesus didn't say, judge not, lest ye be judged. And before you go to your brother, go and take out the plank out of your eye and then go to your brother and take out the splinter in his. And oh, by the way, don't throw your pearl before swine. Now let me go on. It's, just, it's, it's part of that same flow of that passage. Verses 1 through 5 tell us the same way you judge others will be judged. And so we need to walk humbly. We need to be careful. We need to be in prayer. We need to be repenting. But don't expect the world, the pigs and the dogs, to receive the same instruction that a brother or sister might receive. What Jesus is saying in this verse, verse 6, is that you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, has something of incredible value. What does he call it? Look at verse 6. What does he call it? A pearl. What is the pearl? It's a big pearl. What is it? Jesus could be. The gospel. God's holy word. Your faith, you have this incredible pearl, Jesus says. And there are pigs and dogs, unclean people, people who don't know God through Jesus Christ, who've rejected God, and this is a really harsh teaching, who have not put their faith in Christ Jesus, who are not robed in righteousness, made clean by him. And what Jesus says is when you judge the actions of someone who doesn't know him, when you call them out one way or the other, it will have no impact on them spiritually. You see? Hey, my brother, you're you're looking at porn. Don't you know that's a sin? If that man doesn't know Christ as Savior and Lord, he'll go, huh, what? It doesn't matter to me. They hear your righteousness, they hear your words, and it means nothing to them. It's a a pearl before swine. And Jesus says, look, if you think I can, first of all, he says this, go to your brother. Talk to them. Pull that plank out of your eye. Then go to your brother and remove that speck. But if you think that same method is going to work for that person in the world, it's not. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the righteousness of God. So don't think, for me, I can go to my lost sister and say, don't you know you're going to go to hell if you don't receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Huh? What? Okay. What does that have to do with anything? That does me no good. That means nothing to me. So the world, the unclean, the unsaved, will hear the Bible, that's the pearl, and it's truth, that's the pearl, and say, I don't care. It doesn't phase them. In fact, they trample on it and they will attack you. It has little or no impact on that person. And so what do you do? Well, you look at the totality of Scripture. And Jesus says, you know what you do? You just dust off your feet and you move on. Next week we're going to have communion in the second service, in both services. And some of you are going to come in and say, man, that juice represents the blood of Jesus Christ. 
And that bread represents the body of Jesus Christ, and he died for us. I am humbled by this. I thank you, God, for reminding me of what you did by sending your son to die on the cross for me. That's the pearl, and you see it. Oh, this is the pearl. Others are going to come in and say, oh, crackers and grape juice. It's a pig. Something holy and sacred and special. The Lord's Supper, communion. And then some people say, that's nothing. It's a little snack before we go. You see the difference? And Jesus says, don't cast your pearl before swan. Don't give it to the dogs. Jesus himself was preaching in Nazareth, and it's probably a pretty good message. It's Jesus. And how do the people respond? They have this great idea. Let's throw them off the cliff. Brilliant. They are responding like pigs respond to a pearl. His teachings meant nothing to them. That's how they respond to holiness. And I'm not saying that we don't try to reach the lost and tell them the hope of Jesus Christ. Of course we try to reach. Okay, this is really harsh. Of course we try to reach the pigs and the dogs. I was once one. And so were you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us, he says, such were each of us, but we were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of God. When I was younger, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it was like a pearl before swine. I didn't care. Was my girlfriend going to the church? That's what was important. Will there be food there? That's what was important. I could care less about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the pearl. But then God came to me and saved me. And there's another parable about pearls as well, and it's from Matthew 13. Again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And so I would say to you this morning, this is going to sound really harsh, but I, I, I mean it in love. There is, if, you're an outs- if you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord, You're unclean. You've not been washed in the blood of the lamb. As scripture says, there's no judgment here. We're not going to judge you. That's for God to do. I will simply say we love you. And there's a pearl of great price. His name is Jesus. And you can either trample on him and ignore him. Or you can say, yeah, he's worth my life. Because he's given me eternal life. He's worth it all. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I would ask yourself this question. And just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Are you a person that speaks truth to others with the intent to restore them? Are you a type of person that looks at a person's sin and just ignores it and allows that person to continue on? I want to encourage you to be a person of truth and grace this morning. I would ask you this morning, are you a person who Judges others. Do you hold yourself to the same standard? Or are you a hypocrite?
Do you have that judgmental attitude? Makes you feel good, and it get to pat yourself on the back. This morning, I want to encourage you to go to our Heavenly Father right now and let Him take the plank out of your eye. Then walk in truth and grace. Walk humbly. Speak truth to your brothers and sisters and speak with grace the same way you would like it done to you. Do you judge the unsaved? Do you like it when they get theirs? And Do you take joy in the fact that the unsaved will spend eternity in hell? Maybe you need to check your heart. To those in this room that don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, it's very simple. The Bible teaches this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, saved from the consequences of sin, saved to heaven, saved from hell. Today, right now, you can invite Christ into your life, confess Jesus as your Lord, turn from your sin, and God who knows your heart will save you. Would you stand at this time? With heads bowed and eyes closed, our closing prayer, Father, let us walk this world um, treating your passages properly. Father God, let us speak life to one another. Let us encourage one another. Let us pour into one another. Let us sharpen one another. God, let us not be offended when our brother or sister comes to us. Let us receive what they have in grace and truth. Let us weigh it as indisputable or disputable, Father God. Let your word speak to us. Father God, I pray that we would be a people of truth and grace. I pray that we would walk humbly in this life. Go with us as we head our separate ways. Let us love one another well. Let us love those outside the church well without judgment. Let us not presume to know hearts. Father God, let us rest in you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.